And all right, if you are in the children's Sunday school class, Mrs. Haley is back through that door. You're welcome to go back with her, follow her, and they're going to have a good time there. They have apple juice and they had breakfast this morning, amen. I was like, hey, eating better than I did, amen. No, I had honey bunches of oats this morning, praise God. Amen. That'll, that'll make a Baptist shout right there. Amen. And you know what's really good is when you get the just bunches. Oh, have anybody ever had the honey bunches of oats? You ever had honey bunches of oats? Oh, that's good stuff. You ever had the just bunches? Oh, go to the store and get right with the Lord. Amen. Get the just bunches. Amen. It's sweet, good, and it's healthy. And uh, it's good stuff. Amen. I was eating that this morning thinking about manna in the wilderness and how God provided manna for the children of Israel. And I'm looking at my bowl of cereal thinking... Boy, God provided manna for me this morning, amen, and so, I'm just kidding. It was good though, amen, so praise the Lord. Well, thank you for being in Sunday school, amen, excited for this morning, and uh, get to study the Word of God. We're going to open our Bibles again, Psalms chapter 127, verse number 1. We're going to jump right in, Psalms 127, verse number 1, amen, thanks again to... Uh, uh, Brother Jordan, Miss Victoria, for being back with us again in Sunday school. They were here with us last week. Thank you again, sir. Did you? You weren't in a sling though last week. There, uh, <laughs> you had surgery. I'm sorry. Well, I didn't even know that. I got to write that down. And pray for you. Can't write down without a pen. I'll just have to remember it. Amen. Oh, thank you, sir. Praise the Lord. Brother Jordan, Amen. Pray for him. He had surgery. Amen. But thank you for being back with us. Amen. And he. Uh, Write this down. Head surgery. There we go. Thanks for coming back, being patient with me, sir. Amen. I didn't run him off last week, so that's a that's a good sign. You mind that, sir? Okay, thank you. Amen. So thank you, sir. Amen. And uh, praise the Lord. So pray for him. Head surgery. Wow. All right. Well, Psalms 127, verse number one, and we're gonna uh, read this again. Uh, this has been kind of the theme for this uh, series of, of lessons that we've been doing. Uh, last week we learned uh, a little bit more about relationships and the relationships of marriage and, and different things like that. Uh, but we're going to read this verse again uh, to familiarize ourselves. The Bible says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. And so our goal in this series in Sunday School is to build our homes upon the rock which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I was uh, talking with somebody this last week, and you know this is very this is very important and very key because I was talking with somebody and they were talking about how that other religions and other uh, people that you know uh, like uh, Hindus, Buddhism, all this stuff, and they talked about how that these are good people, uh, they serve a God, and they kind of thought that because of their good intentions that. They serve the same God that we serve, they just don't know it. Almost kind of a, a mentality. And I said, I'm sorry, but that's not true, amen. I said, because they don't believe the Bible, amen. And if they don't believe the Bible, they don't believe the same God that I do. And so that's why it's so important when we're studying, we're building our homes upon Jesus Christ. We're not building our homes upon Allah, Buddha, any other God, any other religion that's, that claims to build a home. We're building our homes on the rock that won't move, amen, the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. These promises that God gives us, you can know and take them and know that God will bless them and not have to worry about it. These other religions, I don't care what the, and I was sitting there thinking, I was like, are you listening to yourself? You're telling me that everything that I'm building upon is the same foundation that every other religion's building upon. And I said, that's not true. That's right. They don't have the promises that I have. They don't know the same God that I have. And that's why other religions, they're, they're, the structure of the home is not, is not secure. That's why there's, uh, in, four, in third world countries with other religions, there's polygamy, there's multiple wives, there's uh, adultery, there's fornication. You know why? Because the devil doesn't build a home. The devil destroys it. God's intention is to build a home, a man and a woman for one lifetime that raises godly children. Every other religion tries to teach that you can play around. Amen. That's not God's intention. Amen. So that's why it's so important to know we build our homes and we want to build our homes on the rock. That's, that's Jesus Christ. Amen. So today we're going to learn about responsibility and reward. Responsibility and reward. We've talked a little bit about 
the responsibilities of each of the husband and the wife in the home. And, even, and we're going to kind of even see about the children. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. God gives in the home the responsibilities. We've gone over that. The, the wife is to submit to the husband. The husband is to love the wife. All these things that we've covered, these are the responsibilities that God has given to each individual in the home. So we're going to read here Ephesians chapter 5. Again, we know uh, we're going to go back here. Let's start uh, verse uh, 24. The Bible says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. And then we're going to skip down uh, in then uh, uh, verse, or chapter 6, verse number 1. The Bible says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and singleness of your heart, as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So what we see in these verses is there's a responsibility. The responsibility for the wife is to submit to her husband. The responsibility of the husband is to love his wife. The children's responsibility is to obey and honor their parents. The father's responsibility is to teach and to train without provoking his children to anger. The employee's responsibility is to obey, respect, and to serve. The employer's responsibility is to treat his employee as he himself would like to be treated. And the responsibility of the brethren is to be strong in their commitment to their relationships. All of these responsibilities in these chapters that we go over, the blessing is that God gives us a reward. So remember, we want to... The wife wants to be submissive to her husband. If she's submissive, her reward is the love of her husband. Okay, so that's the, re that's the reward of the wife that's submissive to her husband. The husband's responsibility is to love his wife. His reward is submission from his wife. When a husband loves the right way, a wife will be willing to submit to her husband. When a wife is submitted to her husband, a husband will want to love his wife the right way. The children's responsibility is to obey and honor their parents. Their reward, according to Ephesians 6, is long life and blessing. Amen. Praise the Lord. The father's responsibility is to teach and to train without provoking his children to anger. His reward is obedience from his children. The employee, we said, is to obey, respect, and serve. His reward is promotion and honor. The employer, if he treats his employees as he himself would be treated, his reward is obedience and hard work from his employees. And the responsibility of the brethren, when they're strong in their commitment, their reward is unity and spiritual strength. Now, this is the problem. Satan attacks us by suggesting that we deserve a reward without responsibility. This is the problem we run into. The devil confuses Christians to think, well, I deserve the love of my husband without having to submit to his authority. The husband says, I deserve your submission without having to love you the way God intends. And we begin to think that we deserve the rewards that are found in God's word without having to actually keep our responsibility. That's the way it is with the Christian life. We want the privileges that God gives us as a Christian without having to keep the responsibility that God has. Children are the same way. Teenagers want the reward from their parents, but they don't want to have to be obedient. Teenagers want the reward of having a great job and being promoted to a manager without having to actually work for it. Okay, so our society has gone backwards where the devil's tried to make us think that we deserve to have the end result, but we don't have to keep our end of the bargain. Amen. And we have to remember that if we want God's result in our homes, then we're going to have to do it God's way. That's why I've said in Sunday morning so often, we need to do God's will, God's way, that will give God's result. Amen. When that's a simple math, one plus one equals three. Amen. I was a homeschool, okay? So that's how it works. Amen. Now, 
In Ephesians chapter 5, the wife is compared to the church. The church is described as a glorious church. The word literally means gorgeous. God is saying that the husband who fulfills his responsibility of loving his wife will have the reward as well of a gorgeous wife who possesses true beauty, affection, and love. The reward of loving your wife properly is a lovable wife. As the, in, as the book of Proverbs says that a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Beauty is vain. But when a wife and a, or when a husband loves his wife and there's the proper relationship, the wife will be gorgeous. Not because in man's eyes she has beauty, but in God's eyes, true beauty and true, uh, 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 true beauty and appearance comes from the inside out. Amen. That's why a husband and wife uh, that sometimes we see, we, uh, they, they can last for 20, 30 years because they've focused themselves on the Lord. But there are other husbands and wives that can't stay married for more than five years at a time. Why? Because when you try to do God's will your way, you get your result. Amen. So remember, you want the reward of a good home? Do we want the reward of obedient children? Do you want the reward of a submissive wife and many happy years of being married? Then you've got to apply God's principles to do it. Amen. Just like in a church, we want, we want to make sure that we get God's blessings as a church. Amen. We want God to bless us. Well, but we can't have God's blessings if we don't do it God's way. When you try to take a church and you try to do around maybe principles or around doctrines in God's Word, then what happens is, is God can't put His hand of blessing fully. Now, God can bless because God's Word does not return void. But if we don't, we won't ever experience the blessings that we could have. Just like in a marriage. Uh, some marriages can work. But some marriages are not enjoyed to their fullest. Some people stay married for years but they don't have that love that another marriage has. You know why? Because they have not gotten everything out of their marriage by applying God's principles. They've applied some, but they've not given everything. In the same way in a church, we can see God bless, but boy, we can see God bless even more when we submit ourselves to God's authority. Amen? Now, uh, relationships break down when we focus on the irresponsibilities of others and not our own responsibilities. So in other words, and we've covered this before, where we want the reward, so we have to keep our responsibility. Where we begin to see a breakdown is when a husband and wife focus on each other's responsibilities instead of just keeping their own end. Well, you're not doing what you should. Well, you're not doing what you should. When you focus on each other's responsibilities and not on your own, then you begin to have a breakdown because God says, focus on your end, you keep your end of the bargain, and God will bless the marriage, and the wife will be more apt to keep hers. Amen? And so, anyway, so we've covered, we covered that last week. Now, we're going to move over. There's four areas of greatest attack, though, in our home because we're going to move here now to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14 through 17. Four areas that are of the greatest attack in our homes. We, ha we want to have the reward of a great home but we have to keep our responsibilities. So there's four areas in our homes that are under attack by the devil that we have to watch out. Number, uh, look here, uh, verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The uh, armor of God is not just for the Christian to fight the devil uh, for in the church or out in the world. The armor of God is also to protect your home. We just went through in Ephesians chapter 5, the home. We went through the responsibilities that God gives all the individuals, and then God gives us the armor. God wants you to protect your home. Because if you'll protect your home, then you'll protect your church. And then if you protect your church, you'll protect your nation. So we get backwards where we put everything else before our home. And our home falls apart. Now we're doing great. But then our future generation grows up and we wonder where, why America's falling. You know why? We've neglected the home. Amen. Starts in the home. The first area of attack is our moral appetites. Look there in verse 14. The Bible says, Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Your loins symbolize your purity. 
Satan tries to attack your moral appetites or he tries to get you involved in adultery, immorality, uh, filthy television, pornography, all of these things, the devil is trying to attack the home because he knows if he can attack the moral part of your home, then, he, then you lose the stability, you lose security, and you lose the purity in your home. 2 Peter 2.14 says, Having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, being unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. So you'll find out when, if, when the devil gets you with these moral appetites that you actually will enslave yourself to this sin. These sins will enslave you to where, as Second Peter says, you have eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. They try, but their thoughts and their eyes are constantly filled because their loins are, uh, their loins are not girt about with truth. You're unstable when you have these problems. That's why you ever, when you meet somebody that has a mor moral problem, you ever, know, you ever notice they're, there's something wrong? Their eyes, they, you can always tell somebody that has a moral problem by their eyes. The eyes are the light of the soul. You can look at somebody's eyes and you can know there's, there's something wrong up here. Amen. You can look at somebody's eyes and know when they're into sin. Amen. The Bible talks about that. Uh, now, you don't always know what. That's why you don't go around and say, well, you're in this and you're in this. and You, don't, you can't do that. But your eyes give you away. When you set your eyes on wickedness, guess where your eyes will wander? See, I watch the eyes in our church. As a pastor, I walk guard. You know why? Because your eyes tell what you're in. And I try to keep our church pure. Careful where you let your eyes wander. Amen. Because the devil's after your moral appetite in your marriage. The devil's after your purity. Because, see, purity in a home is a picture of the purity in the church. God wants his church to present it a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. God wants a church pure. God wants to keep it pure. So God also wants to keep our homes pure. It's not saying that we're perfect. But God doesn't want these things to be of a problem. Because again, remember, God pictures the home as His church. God loves the church and God does not commit adultery. Amen. God does not turn His back on His church. God doesn't turn His back on the church and accept another church. But God keeps Himself faithful. So God expects the same from us. Because we are the bride of Christ, the Bible says. And so if Jesus can keep himself, the Bible says, pure, because Jesus is without sin, obviously, but Jesus gives us the strength to keep our homes pure, just as he expects for the bride. Now, so our moral appetites. Number two, the next thing, our heart affections. The breastplate of righteousness, there in verse 14, says, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, that covers the heart. It covers the major organs of the body. Satan attacks your affection. He attacks your heart in your home for your spouse. He will allow your heart to grow cold and hard to your mate to where finally you verbalize that you just don't think that you love them anymore. Matthew 24, 12 says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So when you have sin that's abounding in your life, that sin causes your love to wax cold. That's why when people have sin, they wa their love for God begins to wane. Their love for their spouse, their love for their children, their love for the things of God. Because when sin, when we allow sin to just reign in our mortal bodies, then the love that we have towards the things of God, the Bible says, shall wax cold. And in the end times, many shall wax cold, the Bible says. But it's because we let iniquity abound. It's not because iniquity has the power, but it's because we've been given the victory over sin. So it's not that it's just we can't fight it. It's that we let sin. We let it. Satan tries to sidetrack you from the affection uh, from your spouse through hobbies, other friends, acquaintances, and, and all those things. Something can take the affection of your spouse and... Uh, 
uh, you know, you, you, and maybe you don't even realize it. That's why, you know, wives, when, uh, you know, as men, we get into something. I mean, we get going and we don't even think about it. We, like uh, yesterday, I was out and uh, was doing some work around the church and stuff. I was just out for, you know, a couple hours. I just didn't even think about it. Just got to work and time went by. And I walked in and my wife's like, you didn't even come check on me. She's like, you've been gone for like three hours. I was like, oh, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I just got to work and I said, hey, let's get it done, you know. And she was waiting for me to just come in and say, how are you? What are you doing? You know, men were like, hey, come on. I got a job to do. Got to work. I'll get done. Come on. You know, I ain't got time to walk in for five minutes and say, hey, how you doing? All right, good. No. And, uh, you know, we, we get sidetracked. The devil uses that to try to get you sidetracked daily to where your wife is standing there going, hey, you know, you can give me a hug before you leave. Or, you know, wow, I'm busy. I, I, I just got to go. The devil tries to do that through maybe a hobby, through maybe where you neglect your family, neglect your spouse, and eventually that can cause you to wax cold because that can turn into a sin because those hobbies that keep you from your family will eventually keep you from the church. And that's when it becomes sin. When you put anything before God, if there's anything that you could do on a Sunday that would keep you out of church, the Bible says that's idolatry, that's a sin. That's right. Because that comes before God. You've given that the preeminence before God. Now, God's not against hobbies. Like, I love basketball. I love football. But those things keep people out of church on Sundays. So that became a sin. Because it's idolatry. Amen. So we have to be careful. Be careful. The devil's going to try to attack your affections. Try to draw your affections away from your spouse, away from your children, to put them onto something else to where that will eventually turn into sin because that'll take the place of God. Because no, no couple that's right with the Lord will neglect their family. No husband that is right with God spiritually will not be right with his wife. No wife that is right with God spiritually won't be right with her husband. It's, a, it's, it's, just, it's just how God designed it. When you have God's heart, then you'll want what God intends for your home. When you don't have God's heart, when you're not in your Bible, when you're not praying, and you lose the attitude and the mind of God, then I promise you, you'll begin to see that you lose your family. We have to be careful. Next, Christian activity the next area of attack. Look, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The feet can represent here our Christian activities. Satan attacks your church attendance, attacks soul winning, attacks other forms of Christian service. And doing so, Satan will find it easy then to get you to think like the unsaved world thinks. And you'll be loose with your marriage vows and the love for your mate. That's why it's so important to stay active, putting your feet to work for the work of the ministry. That's why your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Constantly staying busy with the Lord, staying busy doing things that God would have you to do will help keep you right in your thoughts and in your heart. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And otherwise, that, in other words, that's why the devil has so programmed our society now to do everything on Sunday. Because the devil knows if he can take away your church, and you may love the Lord, but if he can take you away from church, he can take you away from prayer meeting, he can take you away from all of those things involved. Now, not all the time can those things work. We, we do have to work. My, my father-in-law, sometimes he has to go out of town over the weekend. But when, he's, uh, uh, when he goes out of town, he finds a Baptist church. Now, sometimes they have a safety problem. There's an emergency. He has to leave early or something like that. But he's in church when he can be as much as he can. A few times there's emergency. So there's things that happen, yes. But when we make a habit of it, the devil, what he's trying to do is take away your activity from the local church, your activity with God, your activity and your walk with God by trying to busy your schedule. And by doing that, you may love God, but eventually your love for God will grow cold because you're not staying active for the Lord. You're investing in other things other than God. And the Bible says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What you invest your life into, what you give your heart and your money to, is where your heart will be. And that will turn you away from the Lord. Satan has attacked this so much to where in our society, in America, we've become so 
busy. Busy. We just have to be busy. We just have to be busy. And the devil's done that because you know why? Because he knows that maybe you'll stay in church. But your children will remember. Well, you know, we skip the Sunday now and then. And your, your children will do twice as much as what you did. The Bible says your children will, you'll reap twice as much as what you neglected in your children. You miss church once a month, your children will miss twice a month. You miss church once a year, your children must, will miss twice a year. You neglect God or maybe not be as faithful, then your children won't be as faithful. Amen. You can just count on it. What you, you reap, what you'll sow. But when children see a mom and dad that were faithful, I promise you they'll remember that. The Bible says train up a child, when, uh, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Be careful what seeds you sow in yourself and in your children. Amen. What you allow yourself to get away with is what your children will abuse. And it may not affect you as you think. That's why we have to be careful with TVs. Because we think, well, that doesn't affect me. I can watch it because it's not affecting me, but it affects your children. Now, it does affect you. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard of. Well, it doesn't affect me. Ah, you're crazy. Okay? You can't tell me a red-blooded American man, you watch that junk on TV, that doesn't affect you. You're a liar. Amen? Because the Bible says it does. Let every man be true, or let, every, let God be true and every man a liar. Amen? You can't watch that junk and it not affect you. But it will affect your children twice as much. Amen? So be careful about your activity. Let your feet be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Amen? Now again, this is not saying that you're going to be able to do everything. Amen? It's not saying that you've got to put away family time. Amen? I, 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 I firmly believe in a family time. I firmly believe in taking care of your family first. But what happens is, is we excuse ourselves and we say, well, I don't have to be as faithful. We just make excuses. There's no excuses, amen. We, there's no excuse to not be faithful, amen. Being faithful does not mean that you'll be perfect, but it means that you'll be there, amen. You're, you, you be faithful, amen. I, again, like with my dad, we, uh, he wasn't uh, preaching every Sunday. There were times we took a vacation, but we were in a church. Amen. We were there when we were even on vacation. I remember one time we were, we uh, barely made it into church. We went to church uh, uh, in our jeans and t-shirts because we were trying to make it to church. We were driving and dad lost track of time. He's like, oh my goodness, we just found, we found the church we were going to. It was in Jackson Hole, Colorado. Beautiful area. But we just, I mean, we skated in like five minutes after the service started. We rolled in, and Dad, he, he, you know, he's a pastor, you know, and Dad's sitting there, and uh, he's in jeans and a T-shirt, you know, and we're just kind of sitting there. We were like, we felt so out of place. But, boy, we were in church, amen. Dad made sure, stay faithful, amen. You can never be too faithful. You can just never be too faithful, amen. You can't say, well, I'm just too faithful to church. <laughs> oh, I'm too faithful to God. Can never be too faithful, amen. Number four, the next thing the devil's attacking is our thoughts and attitudes. The helmet of salvation, as we see there in uh, verse number 16. Uh, well, we see the above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And then uh, verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. Now, there's so much more also to the armor of God, but in relationship to the home right now, the next thing is this helmet that the devil is attacking, and that in, uh, the helmet encloses your head. It represents your thought life. It represents your attitude. It represents how you think and how you uh, react to God. Satan will have you dwell on your rights, your needs, and your desires, not on your responsibilities. You need to resist these attacks that the devil tries to do through the, through the television, through the world, through fashion, through friends, whatever it may be. Do not dwell on what I deserve. Dwell on what God deserves. Especially if you and your mate may be having difficulties. Then don't dwell on the difficulty. Dwell on giving God honor and glory. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Boy, I've memorized that verse. Amen. I put that verse on a 3 by 5 card. Because you know what? The devil's after our thoughts. 
The devil is after how you think. If you don't believe that, then drive down the road and look at every sign you pass by. Go to Walmart. The devil's after your thoughts. The devil's after what you look at on a daily basis. He's after your thought process. He's after what goes through your mind. Because this is what, this is what he knows. In marketing, what the major companies want to do is they want to put themselves before you. So when, okay, for instance, Coke or Pepsi, they want to so put their signs in front of you because they know you're not going to buy something right now, but when you're thirsty, they want to be the first thought that you have. Hey, I'll go buy a Coke, and that gives them money. They know it may not affect you now, but when you have a moment where you're thirsty, you'll spend money. Yeah. Right now, you're not thirsty, so you're like, I'm not going to waste my money. I've got to save. But later, when you're thirsty, you mean, man, I need something to drink. Ooh, Coke sounds really good. So you know what the devil does? The devil puts these things in front of you all over the place. Because you know what? Right now, I'm not going to do that. I love God. But later, you might have a weak moment. And guess what your first thought is? <coughs> oh, man. You think about what you saw. You think about what you dwelled on. What the devil put in front of you. And that weak moment can turn into you allowing yourself to stray from God the Bible says it just takes a moment. Think about Esau. Esau sold his birthright for a pottage in a moment. It was gone. Amen. Judas, in a moment, betrayed Jesus Christ, condemned himself, didn't believe, didn't retrust Christ. In a moment, he was gone. Uh, Samson, in a moment, gave up all that he had just with one clip of the scissors. Just in a moment. You can lose everything you've invested in in a moment of time. And so that's why the devil puts these things. He's marketing. The devil's a master at marketing, putting things in front of you. So when you have a weak moment, your first thought is that lady. Your first thought is that guy. Your first thought is this. Your first thought is that. Keep yourself pure and clean. That's why we have to keep ourselves pure and clean, not only, not only mentally, not only spiritually, but physically. Because we don't want something to be a stumbling block to us, but we don't want ourselves to be a stumbling block to others. That's why in the church we strive for purity. We strive for modesty. We strive for all those things. Why? Because just as I don't want you to have a stumbling block, but I don't want to be a stumbling block to you either. God says it's, even, it's just as bad for a Christian to be a stumbling block to his brother. God gives us how we should look. God gives us how we should act. And God gives us how He wants His church to be pure, holy, clean. Be ye holy as I am holy. But when we neglect that, we, be, we don't realize that the thoughts and attitudes of other people are affected. We're not affected. We don't see ourselves. But somebody else may see us and have a problem. So important to be careful. So important. That's why when, I, uh, when my wife walks out, amen, I give her a good look. I love my wife, amen. I say, I say, honey, that looks good, but it looks too good. You might need to change that. You know why? Because you're men too. I don't want you looking at my wife going, See what I'm saying? That can be a stumbling block to you. God doesn't want that to be with us. Amen? When we as men guard our home, we have to guard not just our thoughts and attitudes, but we also help guard the thoughts and attitudes of others. Amen? God wants a pure church. That's why God wants that that way. So he says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Men, love your wife as yourself. That means you'll protect yourself from danger. Why don't you protect your wife? Because who is the devil after in our homes? The devil, most of the time, is after the thoughts of men, but he's also after to destroy the ladies. Amen. Love your wife as yourself. You would protect yourself, protect your wife. He that loveth his wife, loveth himself. You're willing, to be, you're willing to protect your wife and protect your home, protect your children, shows 
how much you even love yourself. In other words, you love the Lord, you love your reputation. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but look, but nourisheth, nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. God nourishes and cherishes. God provides. God makes sure that we are taken care of. So ought men for their homes. Amen? So again, four areas of greatest attack. You remember this. Moral appetites, your heart affections, your Christian activity, and your thoughts and attitudes. I can't do the number three. I try. I have to do that. Amen. I don't know if I'm the only man in the room. I can't do the, that. Now, last thing. We must understand that a relationship failure is a spiritual failure. When we have a relationship failure in our homes, it's because we have a spiritual problem. When there's a failure, when you look at your home and say, you know what, I'm not doing like I should. You know why? How's your walk with God? When we look at our church and if we say, you know, God's not blessing, where are we failing? We're failing in our spiritual walk. Because your walk with God, your spiritual walk, will affect your physical walk. Amen. The more that you want to grow in Christ, the more... This is what you do. You watch somebody grow spiritually. You watch a new Christian begin to grow. You know why they grow leaps and bounds? Because they're walking with God. But maybe somebody gets saved, they're maybe not as new of a Christian... Uh, or they're a new Christian, but they're not as walking with God, they take a little longer to grow. You know why? It's a spiritual failure. Somebody may grow, we like, wow! And somebody may not grow as much. Both are growing, but God gives the choice up to us. Grow as much as you want. You can grow as much as you want to. God's Word's there. It's just like flowers. Boy, you ever planted flowers? You have some that just go, they just blow up. If not, you're like, whoa. And you have some, they take a little longer. Now, both are growing, and both you have to be patient with, but one takes off, one doesn't. Christians are the same way. We can grow as much as we want to, but, it re but it's a result of our spiritual walk. You'll not build a good relationship without the Spirit of God and the right kind of Spirit. Amen. We won't have a good church without the Holy Spirit. And the more of the Holy Spirit you yield to, the more that you give yourself to the Lord to grow and say, God, I'm going to line myself up with the book, then the more God will let you grow. A great pastor once told me, he said, Son, it wasn't my dad, but he was one of those guys, Son, he said, the, What you do with the Bible determines what God does with you. He said, However much you want to do with God's Word, however much you want to read it, memorize it, Apply it determines how much God will want to do with you. Christians in our homes, if we wonder why maybe is our home not as blessed, why do I not, why do I not see that reward? Well, then how much of the Bible do you have in your home? Amen. Are your children obedient? If not, then how much of God's Word are you giving them and how much of the TV are you giving them? If you want to balance it, put God in there. Say, what are you talking about? Look at the public school. When we had the Bible in the public school, we didn't have half the problems we had. Take the Bible out, now you've got a mess. That's right. God's Word is the direct result on our attitudes. You want your children to shape up? Hey Amen. I want Adeline to shape up. Boy, the other day she told me to stop. I couldn't believe it. Again, I was like, ah. Oh. She said, stop. And she'll hit my hand. So you know what I go in while she's sleeping? For God so loved the world, He gave His <laughs> Say, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. Here we go. Let's try this. But no, as she gets older, I'm going to make sure I get as much of the Bible in my home as I can. You know why? The more that God's Word is involved, the more you get God's result. Amen. The more the devil's involved, the more you get the devil's result. Amen. So let's be busy in our walk with God. Applying the armor of God is a decision that we make every day. You have to every day get up, spend time in God's Word, and make a decision to apply this armor. It's a spiritual armor. You don't have to go through a motion of putting on a helmet and put not all that, but this is a spiritual decision that you get up every day and ask God to guard your heart, guard your mind, guard your feet, and guard your life. Amen. And every day you make that decision, you make that commitment to the Lord, and you ask the Spirit of God to guide you, you watch God bless. Amen. And let's work on that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you.
Lord, thank you for the great lesson, Lord, that you gave to me, Lord, this last week, Lord, and uh, how that, Lord, it's already been prepared. Uh, but, Lord, I just pray over it and study it, Lord, and, and read and apply even to my own life. Thank you, Lord, for the Word of God and how that, Lord, it's a, Lord, the Word of God is quick and sharp and powerful. And, Lord, how that it discerns our thoughts and our actions and our intents of the heart. And, Lord, may we take, Lord, what we've learned. And, Lord, if I know you've spoken to my heart. God, would you help me, Lord, to do better? Lord, I need to be a better husband. Lord, I need to be a better father. And I ask that, Father God, you'd help me to be what I need to be, Lord, and apply and work on the areas that I need to work on, Lord. And just pray that you'd bless our church, that, Lord, we'd have strong homes built upon the Lord Jesus Christ, how much that we need it, God. We love you. Thank you, Lord, so much for all that you've, all that you've done that we don't deserve. Bless now, Lord, as the Sunday morning service, Lord, comes around in a few moments. Would you, Lord, give us a great uh, service this morning, Lord, for all those that are coming, Lord. Would you speak to their heart? If anybody's going to be here, Lord, that does not know, Lord, that if they die, that they'd go to heaven. Lord, may during the altar call, may during the invitation time, Lord, they make that decision, Lord, to come forward and trust you, Jesus, as their Savior and give us an opportunity to show them how they can have heaven as their home. Lord, for Christians alike, Lord, may we take the truth of God. May we apply it. May we be better Christians because of it. May you grow us and help us, Lord, to be as what you would have us to be. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.